So once we learned what a group was this semester, our first inclination was to do what mathematicians typically do, which is to say, all right, so we've defined a thing. Now what kinds of things are there out there in the universe? What kinds of groups can exist? How many different, essentially different kinds of groups can there be? And what we found, I think, over the course of this semester is that that's a pretty nuanced question to answer. Even already, if we have a group with only six elements in it, that group can have a number of different types of structures. It can have a structure that makes it into an abelian group. It can have a structure that makes it into a non-abelian group. It can have a structure that makes it abelian but not cyclic. It could be cyclic. So there's all sorts of different possibilities. And our goal is to somehow try to get our arms around all the possibilities, if we can. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that in the most general case for absolutely any group at all. And we're not going to be able to do it for the case in which our group is finite order but not abelian. So non-abelian groups are the are a vast universe wilderness of all kinds of different types of animals in it. What we will be able to do is answer that question for groups that both have finite order and are also abelian. So the finite abelian groups are something that we now possess the tool work to completely classify, to be able to say, if you give me a finite abelian group, I can tell you what exactly are all the possibilities for the structure of that group in a finite list of options. That's our goal for this last set of videos for this semester. How do we classify the finite abelian groups? So just as an example, we might ask the broad question, how much are we able to know about a group just by knowing its order, just by knowing how many elements that it has. For example, if I say that the order of a group is an even number, so let's say I happen to know that the order of G is 116, that doesn't tell me everything about the group, probably, but it does tell me one really important thing. We've seen in a theorem that that group must have an element of order 2. We know that specific thing about this group only from the fact that the order of that group is even. Another thing that we learn about groups just from their order is if the order of a group is a prime number, then we have this really powerful theorem that completely classifies the structure of that group. Every group whose order is prime is a cyclic group of that prime order. So it's isomorphic to Z mod P, where P is the prime that is the order of the group. We also have this really powerful theorem that says if the order of a group is the square of a prime, so here we're thinking about orders like 9 or 121. If the order of the group is a prime square, then we don't necessarily know the group is cyclic. But we can say, and we have seen, that that guarantees that my group is abelian. And not only that it's abelian, that it has two, only two, possible structures that it can have. It could be cyclic of order 121, for example, or it could be a direct product of two cyclic groups whose order is that prime. So Z11, direct product Z11, for example. And those are the only two possibilities in the universe. And it's that last result that gives us the flavor of what the classification theorem for finite abelian groups is going to look like. You're going to give me a number, a finite number, which is the order of an abelian group. And then I'll be able to, with this theorem, give you a laundry list of here are the different isomorphism types of groups that your group must be isomorphic to, knowing only what its order is. So what's the flavor? The flavor is that these results don't generalize very well. If I know the order of the G is even, then G has an element of order 2. All right, well, what if the order of G is not even? What if I want to know about elements of other orders as well? We don't have a nice generalization for that. And if I increase the number of primes that I have in here, if the order of G is a prime cube, what can I say about prime cube? What can I say about prime to the eighth? What if the order of G is not made up of a single prime power at all? What if it's composite? It's made up of multiple primes. So there's not really yet a way to capture the generalizations until we add the word abelian into this and say we will be able to classify those groups that are abelian and whose order is finite. Turns out we can say a lot about the groups that are abelian just based on knowing what their order is. Finite abelian groups can be completely classified for a given order. For example, if G is an abelian group and its order is 1008, this is going to be an example that we work with a little bit in this series of videos, we'll be able to show that there's a laundry list of in total 10 different abelian groups of order 1008, and G must be isomorphic to one of them. And not only that, all of those groups, it turns out, 
are going to be made out of these really comfortable concrete building blocks. They're all going to be direct products of cyclic groups. And that's the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. It says every finite abelian group is isomorphic to a direct product of cyclic groups. And the theorem actually gives us a nice constructive way to list out what all those possibilities are. And the building blocks, those cyclic groups that make up every finite abelian group up to isomorphism, those building blocks are the cyclic groups whose order is a prime power. So here's the agenda. I want to outline the proof, ultimately, of the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups and see some illustrations. And the key role here, the key players on the stage, are the prime power order cyclic groups. And the theorem will tell us that those prime power order subgroups of G actually are going to be able to tell us the whole story about the structure of G. To get to that theorem, the most important step along the way is to understand why the primes are so important. And that comes in the form of a theorem that I like to call the primes don't talk theorem. What it means is that if I have subgroups inside of G whose orders are powers of different primes, so maybe I have an order 16 over here, so that's a power of 2, and then over here I have an order 25, so that's a power of 5, so powers of distinct primes. Those two subgroups are going to have nothing to do with one another. They're going to have no overlap with one another. The, the powers of 2 and the powers of 5 don't talk with one another. Their only overlap happens at the identity. So we have to understand why that theorem is true and what that's going to do to help us classify the finite abelian groups. And then finally, we want to see what the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups can actually do for us. How do we classify all of the finite abelian groups of a given order? And furthermore, what else can we learn from the really powerful universal result that the fundamental theorem gives us? So that's a pretty ambitious agenda, but it's a great way to finish out the semester. Let's get going.